All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Can you hear me okay on Zoom? Great. Um, so welcome those that are Zooming in, our little digital Sangha, welcome those here in the room. I'd like to start with just a little bit of movement so you can stay in your seat. Um, if you don't feel like moving right now, not a problem. Maybe you visualize yourself moving um, just to help um, come into the body. This class is called Embodied Ethics. So we really wanna um, start transitioning to an awareness of what's happening in our somatic field. So maybe we just start with some shaking, maybe like we're shaking off the day, anything that happened earlier that's still lingering, kind of release, let go, shake it off. And then when you're ready, you can come back down to stillness. Maybe you'd like to close the eyes or just soften the gaze. Maybe come into some rolls of the head around the neck and just let your awareness rest with the sensations of the movement, whatever's feeling good for you right now. So maybe little movement, big movement, maybe coming into some circles with the shoulders. And as we kind of bring the shoulders back and puff out the chest, let our heart come forward. Maybe synchronizing that with the breath, breathing in as we bring the shoulders up. Breathing out as they come down. Maybe you want to come into some side bends here. Just as much or as little as feels good. Keeping the awareness in the torso, the sensations that are caused by this movement. Maybe a little twist. It's whatever's feeling good, what the body's asking for right now to make this transition into this class, our time together. Ah, so welcoming yourself exactly as you are, welcoming yourself into this space, welcoming yourself into this class, taking a moment to Look at each other on Zoom and here in the room, welcoming each other. Here we are as community of spiritual friends here to learn and practice. Nice to see the waves. So uh, welcome to Embodied Ethics. We're at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. This is our sixth session. Uh, and uh, no worries if you're just joining for the first time. Um, these are kind of drop in style. So uh, I'll give a little recap of where we've been before we jump in. Um, so with embodied ethics, we've been kind of chipping away at this uh, idea of how do we be with things that are difficult in the world, things that are unethical, things that kind of rub against um, our aspirations for a constructive and harmonious society. Um, so uh, to start with some definitions for those that have heard this already, maybe bringing a beginner's mind as if it's the first time you're hearing it, see if there's anything different that comes up for you. Um, so embodied ethics, uh, we've been talking a lot about how ethics in this class is this systems of moral principles um, and the behaviors and actions that accompany them. And so the, um, the principles and the guidelines are more on the moral side. And then the ethics are really about the action and the behaviors, which is uh, kind of what brings us into this space together. Uh, these ethics that we're exploring during this series of classes are secular. So even though we are in a Buddhist Dharma center, these are universal. Um, so you don't need to be a Buddhist. You don't have to have a full understanding of the complete system of Dharma or any religious point of view. Um, the secular nature of this is that it's universal. Um, it doesn't require dogma or doctrine. Um, and um, the, the idea that it's embodied, so embodied ethics, uh, that for me, there's two aspects to that. There's the feeling of embodiment. So when we talk about things like do no harm and forgiveness and capitalism and compassion, how do we feel that in our body? 
um, as I've been saying a lot of times with classes on ethics, it's very intellectual. We think a lot about ethics. And so this is an invitation to really feel what's coming up in our somatic fields, but not just about the feeling, embodiment as a feeling, but also embodiment as a model or as an action. Um, so it's not you know, uh, that we just leave this class and and go about our our regular lives that we actually carry forward this sense of embodying um, through practice, through our actions, through conversations and dialogue. Um, so it all kind of comes together to this idea of embodiment of ethics. Uh, my name is Tig, for those of you that I haven't met. Uh, I'm a meditation teacher, contemplative artist. I trained in um, medical and research institutions. And that's also where I teach. Uh, so at Mayo Clinic, Brown University, and Pratt Institute. Um, and here at the Dharma Center. Uh, so uh, a couple guidelines for tonight, as always, an invitation to be present, um, just be with your experience. As I had just mentioned, it's about embodiment. So feeling what arises as we practice and explore um, these concepts. Um, an invitation to share your point of view. We're going to have uh, hopefully about 30 minutes at the end of class for just open dialogue. Um, and so really encouraging you to um, see this as kind of a co-created space. And we do that by um, sharing what's coming up. A lot of my intention for creating this class is to really have a container for us to sound things out and, and explore uh, what these things mean to us. So when we are sharing, they don't have to be perfectly polished, right? Like we heard last week, I'm kind of, we're kind of sounding it out as we talk, um, as we share. And I know that a lot of these topics can really stir things up for us. So uh, as we talked about last week, this is a brave space um, to do that. There isn't any judgment uh, and um really encouraging this idea of co-creating the space, sharing as much as that feels comfortable. Uh, and then an invitation to take care of yourself. So if things are getting really strong in your emotional landscape or your nervous system, uh, take a break, open your eyes, look around the room, feel the ground underneath you. Um, here in the space, you're welcome to make yourself comfortable at home, get what you need. If you need to take a break, feel free, turn your camera off, um, whatever feels supportive for you to be in that kind of zone of growth and learning, which sometimes includes a little bit of discomfort. But if we notice that we're starting to shift into a disassociated state, like zoning out or uh, hyper activated, kind of triggered, um, they're not really conducive to growth, learning, or practice. So really taking care of yourself when you notice these things arising in your experience. As we will have some sharing time, just some um, guidelines around communication that we're speaking from the I perspective, we're avoiding giving advice, um, and that we're aware of the space that we're taking up in the group. So if we seem to be talking a lot, maybe stepping back and allowing someone else to come forward and vice versa, if we've been more quiet and just kind of processing, if it feels comfortable coming forward um, at some point. So um, just a couple of high level guidelines um, as I've been doing, uh, as we have been progressing through this series of classes is I think it's important to name bias and privilege. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing, aside from my unconscious bias, even though I strive to teach universally, there are unconscious biases that will come forward, but also a, a very conscious bias is that I don't believe that our current systems are working. And so I do want to acknowledge that I come into this class with that point of view. I do think that there are problems in the world. I do think that our systems of politics and economy are unethical, unjust. They cause oppression, um, systematic discrimination. Um, and uh, so I, do, I want to be clear that, that I do bring that point of view into this class. And also acknowledge my privilege, having white skin, being embodied in a male form, 
Um, we're going to be talking tonight about gratitude, and that is a very easy thing for uh, a white person, a, a male, to talk about things that um, that we're grateful for. Um, but also naming that that does come from a place of privilege. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that. Uh, and I am going to be sharing some other teachings from other teachers and a video who are also uh, white teachers and really wanting to name that and say that there's an opportunity here for us to use our pri privilege to benefit others. Uh, so um, I think it's important when we talk about a class of ethics to kind of have these conversations around bias and privilege and maybe think about what it is that you're carrying into this class, your biases, um, your privileges, and how can we use those in altruistic ways to benefit not just ourselves, but uh, all those around us in our communities. Uh, I like this idea of kind of starting the class with a little quote or a poem. So I wanted to just kind of start with this quote from Bell Hooks. I'm often struck by the dangerous narcissism fostered by spiritual rhetoric that pays so much attention to individual self-improvement and so little to the practice of love within the context of community. This dangerous narcissism by spiritual rhetoric that pays so much attention to self-improvement, right? And so a lot of the, the teachings that we have at the center really are about uh, our own relationship to stress and suffering, but also it's that other, you know, wing of the bird is our compassionate response, uh, how we open our heart and see that we're here not just for the benefit of ourselves, but for all of those in this group, for all of everyone in our communities and the world in general. Um, so I just really like the way that, um, that Bell Hooks kind of describes this and really want to offer you to consider that making that an intention for your time tonight in the class of um, even though we're going to be practicing in our own experiences, speaking from our own perspectives, let that be a uh, act of love for our community. Um, so kind of transforming this idea of coming here for self-help, which is part of it, um, and self-improvement, which is also part of it but also that we kind of um, use the motivation that it would benefit all beings um, to help guide us. Um, I'd love to just do a quick round of introductions, but before we do that, I wanna invite us into just a couple minutes of, uh, of a little gratitude practice. Um, so this will just be about three or four minutes. Um, so you can stay exactly as you are. If you would like to close your eyes, you're welcome to, or Maybe just soften the gaze. And as we enter into this space together, an invitation here to consider something that's really pleasant happening for you. Maybe in the present moment right now, maybe something that earlier happened today, but just letting the mind, the awareness rest on one pleasant thing that's happening. It can be a big thing, a small thing, a material thing, an energetic thing. If you'd like, you can consider visualizing this if it's a, an event or a material object or perhaps a person. And an invitation here to notice as you rest your attention on this one pleasant thing, what does that feel like? What's arising in the body, perhaps sensations of warmth or softening? Maybe it's an emotional response, a sense of joy. Just noticing what's happening in your experience as you reflect on this one good thing.
and just taking a moment here to find a way to describe what that feels like. And then finally, uh, a moment of appreciation and gratitude. So perhaps a, a silent thank you in the mind directed towards a person or a thing or the universe in general. Just trying it out. What does it feel like to say thank you quietly in the mind? And then starting to make a transition back into an awareness of the space and each other, coming back to open eyes if they were closed. So thank you for that short reflection. Uh, I would love to just go around and hear maybe your name. If you're up for sharing pronouns today, you're welcome to do that. And then maybe just a word or two describing not the thing that is good, not the thing that you're appreciating, but how does it feel? What did it feel like? Maybe just a word or two or a statement describing what came up for you as you turned your attention to the felt experience. So let's start today on Zoom. So if I can have a volunteer to start and then uh, maybe choose the next person after you. So just name optional pronouns and what did that feel like? I'm happy to start us off on Zoom. Um, my name is Tia, and she or they are fine for me. And um, the word, the the description of the feeling, um, I want to say basking, like basking in sunlight, but it's basking in the feeling. Uh, so I don't know, like all over and warm and fuzzy. Yeah. Thanks, Tia. Uh -huh. Um, and I just want to say that uh, Louisa has said that um, that um, that they're going to need to pass. So not Louisa, and I am going to choose Cecily. Are you up for going next? Hey y'all, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So my name is Cecily. My pronouns are they and them. Um. I have no idea because my pal is in the hospital and I was doing test support while you were talking. And I want you to know that all day long, that's what I've been doing, knowing that you would be here tonight. Thank you much. Thank you so much, Noble Sangha, for existing and holding mm. me down. That's what I wanted to say. Check. Thank you, Cecily. And I just want to point out multiple people bowed. There was like a sign of respect and acknowledgement of what Cecily just said. So even though we didn't hear a felt experience there, we saw it. We saw an embodied experience of gratitude towards Cecily sharing that. So thank you. And who's next? Cecily, do you want to call on someone? Um, the awesome person with the pride window. His name is Lance. Hello, Lance. I know you. You go next. <laughs> Cecily, I'm good. Good to see you. Uh, I'm Lance. He, him, pronouns. Um, I guess the word I'm going to use is heart center. It just felt kind of like warmth exuding from the center. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. And I'll call on Angela. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Thank, thank you, Lance. Um, so it's Angela and uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, in, in, in terms of feeling, uh, the sensation that came up for me was a sensation of lightness, mm. just, just very light. Mm. And I will pass it to Ronnie. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ronnie and Chelsea. Um, she, her, 
she her also. And um, for me, there was a feeling of um, like being full and abundance. Mm. And my feeling was connection. Thank you. And I'll pass it to Jules, Julie. I don't have my glasses on, sorry. Yeah, no, that's, that's good, Julie. Uh, they, them. Uh, sorry, but it's the same. <laughs> I felt like this real warmth and light from inside. So, mm. yeah. thanks, Jules. Uh, so I think that's everyone online. Uh, she did yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Noam. I use he or they pronouns. And my feeling was, uh, it was actually like almost like a PT sensation. It was like a rocking kind of really nice feeling. Yeah. Rocking. What was the word that you used? PT. It's a, it's a, yeah. Thank you, no. PT is a, a Sanskrit word. For, it's a, it's a feeling of, uh, it's a kind of a, joy that is associated with the jhanas okay. and it's often it often has like a rocking uh component to it where your body is kind of vibrating my name is matthew i use he him and i felt a a warm flush across my cheeks gradually spreading across my cheeks Thank you. My name is Daniel. I use he and him. And for me, it was visual, uh, uh, like a glow, actually like kind of like a, like a glowing worm. I know that doesn't sound, may not sound appealing, but it felt, it was very positive. Mm, thank you. Beautiful. Thank you all for sharing. I am experiencing, uh, like I noticed it pretty quickly as soon as people started talking, like my cheeks. So like, it's actually kind of a soreness, but it's a good soreness, you know, like smiling, the effect of smiling. Um, and when we were in that practice, I was feeling the sense of community and connection. So kind of heard that from some other people. So already we're embodying this idea, you know, we're embodying, tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about how that gratitude and appreciation that we just did a short reflection on is actually related to ethical ways of being. Um, so thanks for joining me in that kind of um, that reflection. So we're going to talk about gratitude, but in a minute or in a minute, and I just wanted to kind of frame the journey that we've been on very quickly um, for those of you that are just joining us tonight. <clears throat> Again, for those of you that have been with us for this series, listen with a beginner's mind as if it's the first time. Uh, we know that the mind is never the same. So we can hear the same thing two different times and we get different things out of it. Um, so with our exploration of ethics in the, with the absence of having any kind of religious worldview or agreed upon doctrine or dogma, the pillars of ethics that we've been exploring are this idea of interconnection or interdependence that everything is connected and not even so much that it's connected like we're separate and there's string connecting us, but that we're interconnected, that these causes and conditions that are arising um, are what brings us all together. So we kind of did that practice of calling to mind what we eat and the journey that ingredients in our food have taken to get to us and all of the energy of the sun, the soil, the gardeners, the farmers, the people that cook the meal, that energy becomes part of us. And then we can choose what to do with that, just as a representation of that kind of interdependence, interconnection. Um, when we've been, we've been talking a lot about kind of the suffering that comes from unethical ways of being. And the reason for me why interconnection is so important is because I don't think that we can ethically be happy and joyful 100% if we know that there is so much suffering in the world. And if one is suffering, we're all suffering in a certain degree. Um, so it's an important pillar of all of these ethical systems is this interdependence. And the other pillar is our shared humanity. 
And so we all come from different walks of life. We've all had different experiences in our life, but the common element that we're all experiencing as beings is that we want to feel good and we don't want to feel bad. So even among our greatest differences, we all share that same attribute. We know what it's like to be joyful and have gratitude. We experience it in different ways, but we all know what it feels like to appreciate, enjoy, bask, savor. And we also all know what it's like to suffer in different ways, different reasons, but it is a common trait that we all know what suffering is like. So it's these two ideas of interdependence and our common beingness um, that are kind of the platform for the secular ethics that we've been exploring. In our third class, we talked about do no harm, looking at uh, how we might be causing harm to ourselves or to others, and we related that to forgiveness. And in the past two classes, we've been exploring compassion and its incompatibility with capitalism. Uh, So really robust conversations that we've had over the past two weeks. Thank you for those of you that joined for that. Um, And some discomfort that came up, but really turning and looking at how we are accountable for perpetuating the cycle or the systems of oppression and harm. And it's hard. You know, we talked a lot last week about a brave space and it takes courage to turn and look at what our own contributions to uh, the suffering in the world. Uh, And in those past two weeks, we talked a lot about capitalism. So if you're interested, all of those classes are recorded on the Dharma Collective's YouTube channel, um, and they're pretty clearly labeled. So you can check those out if you want to catch up or revisit anything. Um, I am from uh, from a a train of thought that if we're going to talk about problems, we also need to talk about solutions. And so last week we talked about how problematic these systems of capitalism are and our practice of compassion as one of the solutions for it. Um, And so tonight we're gonna continue that conversation around looking at gratitude, but not just gratitude as a felt experience, but also as the doorway to what uh, you may have heard of called gifting economy. Um, so we're going to dive into what that uh, what that means in our class tonight. So we're going to um, talk a little bit about gratitude. We're going to have some time to practice. Um, and then we're going to talk about gifting economy and then have uh, hopefully about 30, 30 minutes to talk and share. Um, so. Going back to that reflection at the beginning of class on on how it felt to think about this one good thing. Um, This thinking about feeling and expressing what we enjoy, what feels pleasant, what we're grateful for is really the key in developing a sense of appreciation for the things that we do have. We talked a little bit about how capitalism thrives on a lack and scarcity mindset. And so in order for that that system of economy to work, we have to believe that there's not enough, that we have to compete against each other, that we have to win, that we have to sell each other, right? So capitalism instills this sense of lack and scarcity in us, whereas gratitude really is an invitation for us to turn and look at where there is enough. And it can be simple things like clean water, fresh air, Uh, a a bed to sleep in. They don't have to be these big things. They can be, and that's super helpful to feel grateful for. But the idea of practicing gratitude almost as the antidote to the lack mindset. So where there is enough, we can start reprogramming the pathways in our brain that instead of focusing on the things that we don't have or this perception that there's not enough, we can um, develop through a consistent practice of Um, thinking about feeling and expressing what we're grateful for to help combat some of that lack that capitalism is um, programming us to feel. There's also a concept that I talk a lot about, and many of you have probably heard me say this before, but we have a negativity bias. It's built in as a survival mechanism that we are constantly scanning for threat or things that are wrong. It's a survival mechanism, and it served us pretty well, well, Until modern time, for the most part, we do live in a relatively, 
safe society that we don't really need that negativity bias all the time as much as we did before we had kind of established some of these basic systems of um, survival and safety so gratitude helps also combat the negativity bias I'm not saying that we should bypass or turn away from where there might be threat. It is good to be aware of where things might be challenging or a threat. Um, but when we practice gratitude regularly, it helps combat, it helps overcome that negativity bias. So instead of just focusing on the things that are wrong, we can kind of hold a spacious view of what's happening. And um, as many of you know, I teach in hospitals. I interact with a lot of healthcare providers and parents in the neonatal intensive care unit. So they have sick babies. And talking about gratitude when you're not sure if your child is going to make it through the night sometimes doesn't really land very well. And so it's not about bypassing what's hard. It's a practice that we sustain over time that allows us to kind of open the aperture of the lens. So even though there are these difficult things happening, whether it's negativity bias, a threat, or difficulty with our health or someone that we love, or hearing difficult news, when we practice gratitude consistently, we're able to see a broader picture. We're not trying to get rid of the things that are hard. We're just trying to open it up a little bit more so we're not so hyper fixated and what we call spiraling into these difficult um, thought patterns. Um, as we're going to hear a lot about when we get to gifting economy, gratitude, and we heard in our shares, gratitude helps build a sense of connection. Where capitalism is a sense of isolation and separation, gratitude is oftentimes a coming together. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that with the gifting economy. So it's important that we not just think about what we're grateful for, but that we also feel it and express it. And some of the science is showing us is that there are benefits to a gratitude journal. You know, we get better sleep. Some of these things that I've already been naming happen. But really where, where the magic is, is when we feel it. That's why the invitation was to come into the body. How does this feel in the body? And then express it. So that in that practice, it was just a silent thank you. Um, but maybe it's, you know, we're going to do a little bit of, of gratitude practice shortly. It's make setting an intention to acknowledge people or write an email or a text or a card or the way that we, you know, we say thank you almost like it's nothing now, you know, when someone holds a door or when we leave the market, we say thank you to the person that um, bagged our groceries but like really taking a moment to say like, what are you thank Thanks for being here. I appreciate you, you know, like really going the step further and just thanks. Uh, and so not only do we get a benefit from that because it feels good, but then it creates this ripple effect, which is really what the basis of the gifting economy is about. It makes us when when we share our appreciation in a meaningful way, it's not just feeling good for ourselves. It feels really good to be acknowledged when we do something nice for someone. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but as we heard, uh, Tia sharing the basking, this kind of savoring. So there's the gratitude that we practice when we write in our journals or at the end of the day, we think about things that, that were good that happened during the day, but then there's also the practice of being present with it as it's happening, right? What a way to practice presence is with something that feels good and really savoring that moment as it's happening being with it fully. Um, the practice that we're going to move into to tonight is similar to something that we've been practicing in this series of classes before, where we're using our sensory experience to anchor our awareness. But one of the bridges between gratitude and mindfulness is this sense of receiving. So in gratitude and appreciation, mostly arises because we were given something, because we received something. And it's the same thing with our sensory experience that we're receiving. We're receiving the breath. We're receiving sensations. We're receiving sound. We're receiving thought. So to help us start orienting to that kind of point of view, we're going to do a practice. This one will be shorter than what we normally practice, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And we'll just check out a couple of different sensory experiences and see what it's like to receive that sense. 
and then we'll end with a little bit more time to um, feel into some some gratitude for things that we're receiving. Okay. So um, we'd like to invite you to come into a way of being, whether it's seated or standing or laying down that feels comfortable for the next maybe 12 or 13 minutes. Maybe you'd like to close the eyes or soften the gaze. If you're at home, you're welcome to turn the camera off if that feels supportive. Knowing that you can always change your posture during the practice. The key is really coming into a, a way of being that allows you to be comfortable yet alert. So relaxed, but not too relaxed. Inviting a sense of softness and ease into the body. Relaxing the muscles of the face, the jaw, the shoulders. perhaps checking out the abdomen or the pelvic floor or any areas of tension or squeezing and perhaps a sense of letting go. And balance with that sense of ease is a sense of a vivid and crisp attention. So even the body, even though the body is relaxed, we can come into a, a dignified posture. Maybe sitting up a little bit taller. If we're laying down, making sure that the head, the neck and the back are in a straight line. And really setting that intention to stay at ease, but alert for this practice. And let's start to rest the awareness with the breath. If coming into the body and noticing the breath is not available for you right now, you can rest your attention just outside the nostrils or the upper lip and see if you can feel the movement of the air here in this area. Or perhaps you'd like to come a little bit further into the nostrils or down into the chest. And we're simply using the sensation of the breath as an anchor, an object of our awareness. Gently resting our attention on the breath, not forcing or manipulating the breath. And being with the felt experience of the breathing body. And oftentimes when we choose an anchor to rest our attention with is when we realize how busy the mind may be. So as we aspire to be with the breath, we also may notice that the mind is moving into thoughts, to-do lists, analysis of things that happened earlier, and remembering that all of that too is welcome. We don't need to change or fix anything in the mind. Just noticing whenever the mind moves away from the breath and gently inviting it back, the next breath in, a chance to begin again. And for the next cycle, a few cycles of breath, Let's start to focus on the breath as something that we're receiving. Oftentimes we hear the phrase, take a breath. And hear an invitation to consider receiving the breath, not taking it, receiving the breath. receiving the air as it flows into the body, 
receiving the fresh oxygen as it saturates the tissues of the lungs and replenishes the spent blood. Perhaps even on the out breath, we can receive a sense of ease or softening as we let go of the air. And there's nothing really to do here. Just consider, orient ourselves to the breath as if it's a gift. Perhaps savoring the breath, basking in this gift of life as we breathe in and out. And you're welcome to stay with the breath or perhaps you'd like to shift your awareness to another sensation in the body. Perhaps sensations of contact of the chair beneath you or the soft touch of fabric against the skin. Maybe there's a pleasant sensation somewhere in the body that you would like to rest your awareness with. And either staying with the breath as an anchor or shifting to another point of interoception, feeling the body from the inside. And as we rest our awareness with this sensation, so too we consider this a receiving. The nervous system is sending signals to the brain that we're receiving. And so again, just orienting ourselves to a way of being with a sensation as something that we're receiving. You may even consider a wandering mind as something that we're receiving as well. And we can choose whether or not we want to follow what it is that we're noticing in the mind. We have agency, we have choice to come back to the breath or the other sensation in the body. letting go of any expectations of how this practice should or shouldn't be, just being fully with what's unfolding in your present moment. Now let's make a transition from sensations in the body now to turning our awareness to sound. Just like we were following sensations of breath or another part of the body here, we're using the sound that we're hearing or even the lack of sound as the object of our awareness. And then resting for a few moments here with the orientation that we're receiving sound. 
the waveforms of sound are arriving into the eardrum, being processed in the brain and labeled as a sound. So just resting for a few moments, receiving sound. Notice how the mind may be responding, preferences or dislikes of certain sounds. Maybe you'll notice the mind moving into labeling or analyzing the sounds. And simply just keep returning again and again to this orientation of receiving the waveforms of sound. And then we'll make one more transition in this embodied awareness practice. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to shift from sound to the sense of sight. So as you're ready, opening the eyes if they're closed, and just notice as light starts to enter into the awareness, perhaps considering looking around the room that you're in and receiving color, form, contrast and texture. Instead of thinking that you're looking at something, orienting to the sense of sight as something that you're receiving. Perhaps returning to closed eyes or softening the gaze once again as we shift out of that little experiment, receiving sight, receiving the senses. And let's keep exploring this idea of receiving. So for the next few moments, we'll just rest in silence as we consider all of the good things, the pleasant things that are happening in our life. People, events, objects. Just taking some time to let the mind consider all of these gifts that we receive. How they feel and perhaps moments of appreciation and thanks.
And this is not a command to be grateful. If that's not feeling available to you right now, you're welcome to shift to a sensory experience and continue practicing receiving. And if you are considering moments of appreciation, just notice what it's like to be in the same orientation of receiving. You may want to rest the awareness or linger for a little while with one particular object of gratitude, or perhaps, perhaps letting the mind present all the different aspects of life that might be pleasant, or supportive right now. And considering, is there anyone or anything that you would like to express your gratitude towards? Whether it's returning to that silent thank you in the mind's eye, or perhaps it's an intention to express your appreciation in another way after class or in the days ahead. And as we come to an end of this practice together, let's follow one more breath as we receive it into the body. And then as we let go and exhale that breath, letting go of the practice, taking your time to transition back to open eyes once again, making any movements or stretches that would help feel supportive to make this transition back into an awareness of our circle here. So thank you all for joining me in that practice. I'd love to hear what came up for you, but first I'm going to make the transition into gratitude and in talking a little bit about gifting economy, uh, and then we'll open it up for, for conversation. So if there are things that you want to share or ask questions about that practice, we can do so when we get to that uh, open sharing in a couple minutes. Um, so one of the premises of um, this alternative form of being in the world, this more ethical way of being as an alternative to capitalism is this idea uh, that when we receive something, when we feel appreciation and gratitude, that may you may have noticed this arising in some of your reflections today, that there's also uh, an innate arising of wanting to give. So when we receive something, Oftentimes we feel like we also want to give. That might be a thanks, like we give thanks. I always think about that. Like we we kind of take it that word Thanksgiving for granted, but we're actually when we receive something, we give thanks. And so it creates this sensation or this experience that when we receive something or we reflect on things that we're receiving, that then very soon after that arises uh, some sort of desire to, uh, to give back. Um, and so this is really the premise as we kind of shift from gratitude, which is the ground, the foundation of a gifting economy, that when we feel grateful, we wanna give. 
And so this is very radical when we think about the current structure that we're in right now, where we're taking and we're being sold to and we're buying things and we're exchanging things. This is a kind of radical way. We hear Thanksgiving, we hear gratitude all the time. But when we start framing the way that we orient to what's happening in life as that we're receiving, it kind of shifts the game a little bit. So I want to talk a little bit about gifting economy just for a couple of minutes. I have a short video to share and then we'll open it up and talk. So how many are familiar with gifting economy? A little, I got a lot of this going. Okay, great. Um, so I want to just read this, these, this kind of definition of a gifting economy. It's an economic system based on gift giving in which services or goods are given without an agreement or expectation as to a subtle, a suitable payment or trade to be made in return. So it's uh, unconditional. Instead of monetary gain, gift economies often rely on intangible rewards like a sense of contribution, gratitude, community, honor, or prestige. So as we'll hear in the, the short video that I'm going to share in a moment, one of the examples is Burning Man. So for those of you that are familiar with this kind of event uh, in the desert, uh, and it is a gifting economy um, in theory. There is, you know, we, we do need to bring your own stuff that you need to buy. But the idea is that each of the camps are offering something to the other people that are that are out there. Um, without condition. It's not an exchange. I'll give you this if you give me that. We're not bartering. It's just giving. I have enough and so I want to give. Um, we are sitting in an example of a gifting economy right now with the Dharma Collective. This is a Donna-run organization for Dharma teachings. So this teaching that I'm giving tonight is free. You're not paying to be here. There's no exchange for the time and effort that I put into preparing or being here, this is a gift. Donna or a donation is not an exchange for this teaching. It's a gift that you give in return to help support our teachers and the center. This is the perfect example of a gifting economy. Um, and I've been experimenting with this as many as you know, for the past eight years of kind of alternative forms to capitalism. And so teaching is one of the ways that I'm experimenting with this. My art, many of you know that I do large scale earth art installations on beaches. There's one in my profile picture there on Zoom that's made out of chalk. So those are free gifts. People are not, you know, there's not like uh, ropes outside my art that say you need to pay in order to get in here, right? It's a free gift for people. Um, and one of the other ways that I've been sustaining myself is um, the housing, the places that I've been living have been gifted to me for the past eight years. A lot of this comes from people acknowledging that I do operate in this way and they want to contribute to sustaining me. So they gift me places to stay. If they have a, an extra room or an extra house or they're going on vacation, I can house it. These are all gifts. They're not exchanges. We're not bartering for them. This is just reciprocal or uh, uh, unconditional giving. Um, so some examples of how that can work. I want to um, shift to this video. You can use watching this video as a, a little bit of a practice. So just notice what comes up as you listen and, and hear. Instead of saying thanks before consigning it to deposit, the polite response expected from you was to show up at her house in a week with a better gift, or to vote for her in the town election, or let her adopt your firstborn child. All of these things might not sound so strange if you are involved mm -hmm. in a gift economy. This phrase might seem contradictory. After all, isn't a gift given for free? But in a gift economy, Gifts given without explicit conditions are used to foster a system of social ties and obligations. While the market economies we know are formed by relationships between the things being traded, a gift economy consists of the relationships between the people doing the trading. Gift economies have existed throughout human history. The first studies of the concept came from anthropologists Branislaw Malinowski and Marcel Moss, 
who described the natives of the Trobriand Islands making dangerous canoe journeys across miles of ocean to exchange shell necklaces and armbands. The items traded through this process, known as the Pula Ring, have no practical use, but derive importance from their original owners and carry an obligation to continue the exchange. Other gift economies may involve useful items, such as the potlash feasts of the Pacific Northwest, where chiefs compete for prestige by giving away livestock and blankets. We might say that instead of accumulating material wealth, participants in a gift economy use it to accumulate social wealth. Though some instances of gift economies may resemble barter, the difference is that the original gift is given without any preconditions or haggling. Instead, the social norm of reciprocity obligates recipients to voluntarily return the favor. But the rules for how and when to do so vary between cultures, and the return on a gift can take many forms. A powerful chief giving livestock to a poor man may not expect goods in return, but gains social prestige at the debtor's expense. And among the Toraja people of Indonesia, the status gained from gift ceremonies even determines land ownership. The key is to keep the gift cycle going, with someone always indebted to someone else. Repaying a gift immediately, or with something of exactly equal value, may be read as ending the social relationship. So, are gift economies exclusive to small-scale societies outside the industrialized world? Not quite. For one thing, even in these cultures, gift economies function alongside a market system for other exchanges. And when we think about it, parts of our own societies work in similar ways. Communal spaces, such as Burning Man, operate as a mix of barter and a gift economy, where selling things for money is strictly taboo. In art and technology, gift economies are emerging as an alternative to intellectual property, where artists, musicians, and open source developers distribute their creative works not for financial profit, but to raise their social profile or establish their community role. And even potluck dinners and holiday gift traditions involve some degree of reciprocity in social norms. We might wonder if a gift is truly a gift if it comes with obligations or involves some social payoff, but this is missing the point. Our idea of a free gift without social obligations prevails only if we already think of everything in market terms. And in a commercialized world, the idea of strengthening bonds through giving and reciprocity may not be such a bad thing, wherever you may live. We made it. <laughs> Thank you for, for the, the team effort to make that happen. So a couple of key points in that video, we heard them talk about the difference between the transactional exchange and a human relationship. So in our current paradigm, when we pay for something, it's done. We exchange and we're done. When we gift, when we give, because we have enough, we see where we have enough and we have that feeling, that, that desire to want to give to others, it creates um, the human connection, right? So instead of just this kind of transactional engagement, we actually have a human connection. And you heard some of these words being used in that video, it creates bonds of obligation and reciprocity, right? And so, it, but it doesn't mean it's not bartering, it's not exchanging. So we're not reciprocating, like you give me a sweater, so I'm gonna give you a sweater. It's more someone gives me something, I feel grateful, and then I want to give back into the world. I want to spread that. I want to say thank you. And so that acknowledgement of that gift then um, makes the other, helps the other person feel, feel good. So then that starts becoming that ripple effect. It also doesn't have to be because one person gives me something that my bond of obligation is solely with that person. It might be with someone else uh, paying it forward. Um, so I want to, uh, one other point, uh, because we've been talking a lot about capitalism, which hoards wealth, gifting economies help evenly distribute wealth. So if the people, this, this 1% or 0.1% that has all of this wealth that's being hoarded can start embodying what I'm calling the, the ethics of gratitude, then it will help ease some of that distribution of wealth. Um, for those of you uh, that are not familiar with Charles Einstein, Charles Eisenstein, he is a thought leader in this world, in this area. Um, so I want to read a quote from him. I highly recommend you checking out. He has a book called Sacred Economics. 
And it talks a lot about the things that we're exploring in this class. Um, sacred economics traces the history of money from ancient gift economies to modern capitalism, revealing how the current money system has contributed to alienation, competition, and scarcity, destroyed community, and necessitated endless growth. The gift economy represents a shift from consumption to contribution, transaction to trust, scarcity to abundance, and isolation to community. So there's obviously considerations here. We can't, you know, I'm not proposing that we just shift to a gifting economy. You know, it's what I've learned in my experimenting is that it's very difficult and it's very risky to put your basic needs in the hands of others, right? But we can start practicing. And so as one of these ideas of embodied ethics is how are we generous? How are we giving our time, our money, our resources that we have to others that might be in need? Um, so I want to just be clear that I'm not proposing that we get rid of capitalism and replace, replace it with gifting economy. It's more about bringing this awareness to the destructive nature of how the exchange of our current system um, is and how we can overcome that with this gratitude practice, with this focus on creating gifting economies within our own communities, uh, or how we orient ourselves to the world, even as simple as a mindfulness practice where we consider our senses as something that we're receiving. So I want to open it up. Um, you know, what's coming up? What, what, what does it feel like for you to hear some of these concepts around gifting, to consider gratitude as an embodied ethic? Um, I have a couple prompts if we need them, but I just want to open it up and see kind of what's coming up for you. How's this feeling? How's this landing? Um, for those on Zoom, you're welcome to uh, put any thoughts in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and then in the room, if we can just use the microphone so our friends can hear. So this is kind of open dialogue. How are you feeling? What's coming up? What are you noticing? Louisa. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, the one thing that I just wanted to share, it's something that I've become aware of the last year or so. It's a, it's a website that connects people who need housing or who want to pet sit or dog sit or house sit with house owners that need pet sitters. So it's a straight up trade. I mean, you pay to be a member of the site to be connected, but it's a trade. And a lot of people who are like artists and don't have much of a stable income. A lot of people are using this. Uh, and I've met wonderful people that way. Like I've met so many great people. I met this Australian couple. They're they're traveling the world just using the site pretty much for, and they are really touched by how many amazing people they are meeting. So I just wanted to share that uh, because I feel like it might not be like strictly gift economy. It's sort of a trade, but it just kind of made me think of it. So just wanted to share. Mm. Yeah, thanks. And I love, you know, just sharing kind of ideas and, and things that you've heard about or other gifting economies and other communities. So I think that's called Trusted House Sitters. Is that the one that you're referring to? Small antidote, I won Trusted House Sitter of the Year in 2018. So this has been like a really big part of my journey <laughs> because I have been practicing with this. It's, it's part of resource-based sharing, which as Louisa was mentioning, is slightly different from gifting, but it's still in the same realm. It's not a transactional exchange. It's not necessarily bartering. I, what my experience is that the, the homeowners, the pet owners actually want to share their space. They feel bad that their house would be empty. And so they want to gift it to someone. And yes, it is an exchange, um, for caretaking, but the premise usually is coming from gratitude, you know, that they feel grateful that they've received. They don't want to put their pets in a kennel. They want, you know, they want them to have the connection. But what I loved about the, the way that Louisa was describing it is that it was all about the connection, the people that we're meeting, the like minds, the like hearts that are coming together through this alternative form of economy. 
Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> um, and um, in the chat, um, Cecily had uh, has put uh, mutual aid groups. Mutual acres. Mutual aid groups. Oh, mutual aid groups. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Cecily. No, do you? Have yeah, I'm thinking about a few different things. Uh, right. Two of them are that it's interesting. I think that I participate in the usual, you know, I have a job, I get paid for it. And I give some of that money, my landlord for rent, you know, I go to the store, I buy food. I mean, I participate in that system. And I participate in some gifting systems. Dharma Collective is one. And uh, and so it's interesting to think about those two running side by side and how they work together and how they're in conflict. So that's, I don't have anything more to say about that, but I've been just thinking about that. But then the other thing that I'm thinking about is that we, I think we all do some of this without thinking of it in certain contexts. And one that comes up for me right now is uh, within my family and uh, my Brothers and I have been sort of taking turns taking care of my mom. And we just do that. We're not getting paid for it, you know, and there's no expectation of reciprocity. But there is this sort of feeling that, you know, she took care of us when we were young. Of course, it was her choice to have kids, but that's another matter. So the, I think we all have ways in which, you know, we do this with friends. Friends come to visit. They stay with you. You don't charge them. If you go to visit them, you stay with them. They don't charge you, right? So there is, we all participate in that to some extent. And, and, and for me, a question is, how can we extend that, right, to, to encompass more of our lives? So thinking about i have a question <laughs> what is it that stops us you know yeah. like i like you had the more positive slant on it like yeah. how do we extend that but why is it why is it hard yeah. like what what would stop us from extending that approach yeah any thoughts on that i mean two thoughts one one is that you know we we are products of the system and there is even if we're aware of it, there's a there's a level of like scarcity mentality that's that's holding us back, right? But also, I think that um, I think that we're human beings are have evolved to live in small societies, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly those of us who live in San Francisco and other big places like the need. What we if we just started giving to everyone who needed it, we would give it all away quickly because the need is so large. And, and we were talking earlier about you know you you you, you sometimes the the overwhelm of you know society's needs and problems it can be overwhelming. Mm. So I think that's part of it. And and as I think about you know how I operate, like I said, in the two economies, you know that. that yeah, there's like a balance there. And there is a, there is, one does have to pick and choose when it's going to give what to, because mm -hmm. really I could be a, everything I own away mm -hmm. in short order. And maybe that would be okay. Yeah. But yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So here, what, when what Noam is sharing is this idea of like, how do we reconcile the need to make sure that our needs are met, but then at the same time that we're being generous and that we are giving? Any thoughts on that or what Noam was sharing? I'll, I'll just say one other thing, but then I want to pass it on. Like the key there is sure. Like we can never be sure, but mm. it's that need for security that drives us to, you know, participate in yeah, to yeah. not give everything away, right? Any thoughts on, on what Noam shared? 
Yeah. Um, if I could, I'm I'm thinking that uh, a, a few things, but basically I'm thinking that there's this idea of care and the care we have for our family. And that's like, well, that's priceless, right? But it also has a value. Um, and yeah. that value could be recognized, right? Like when we talk about poverty now, we talk about, uh, we still measure it based on the 30s and food and don't take into account housing, things like that. We don't take into account the work that folks do to care for people, including our, our, our family, but also other folks. Um, I think that we have like these private equity firms that are taking money out of uh, nursing homes, that there would be plenty of people who would want to be there helping out if they could be compensated, uh, you know, reasonably. And then those that money goes into, you know, um, wealthy peoples, you know, they keep on getting richer and, and then they um, graciously, magnanimously gift so this idea of gifting to me is like it at a certain level, it it's problematic because I think that if if Bill Gates and all these people who are gifting all of their wonderful money to to all these organizations and private foundations, if they actually gifted it to democracy and paid their taxes, we wouldn't have a lot of these problems. And so <laughs> I think that if we have like um, so, so, so I would participate in a gifting economy as, um, as a, as a way to undermine this, um, perverse, uh, you know, uh, capitalism, but, um, but there's also this other thing that Noam said that I was thinking of too, which is that, um, he's giving back to his mom in a sense. But it's not, it's not, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. It's also just because he's her mom. And I think it's really interesting that um, like Buddhism started from urban areas where there were there was enough of an economy where folks could support um Bud Buddhists, right? The bhikkhus and kunis, right? And so um like the the idea of having the wealth and having a surplus is not a bad thing. Um, I think that just like we could really seriously push on what we value, what we track, the 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 numbers that we track, and how much someone needs care and how long someone cares for them should be something that we track in as part of our you know government stuff. So. Mm government healthcare systems yeah, yeah absolutely yeah yeah thank you for sharing that Jules Tia I have a I have a couple things in the chat I'd like to share with the room if that's if it's if we're in it mm -hmm. in between moment um uh Ronnie um Ronnie and Chelsea have put in uh, that free cycle is a place to offer things you no longer need or to request things that you need. And there's a, 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 a structured network with the free cycle. Um, and then Louisa uh, surfaced the Buy Nothing Neighborhood Groups. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to really say that the Buy Nothing Mission Facebook group has, like, the person who administers that has such an intense a sense of shaping community that it is amazing. And uh, I haven't participated in any other Buy Nothing group, but other people who've joined from other places have really commented on the care that she has taken. And I certainly see it as someone who uh, also works on fostering community. I see her working at it and I find it astoundingly successful and amazing. Um, mm. Thank you, um, Ronnie and Louisa and Tia. Cecily. Hello. 
I have a very polite, genuine question, please. Mm -hmm. um, the, one of the previous speakers said that Buddhism started in a place where people had enough abundance to support the, I think they were saying to support the Buddhist um, teachers. Is that true? Do we have documentation about that? I'll let Jules, do you want to, I, I have a response, but Jules, I want to give you the opportunity to respond. Oh, just, just, I can point to um, some things that I've read. Um, that's, that's all, but, um, you know, it's not like there wasn't uh, economic differentials or that there weren't poor people there, but just that there was enough of an economy so that, um, yeah, so that monks could be supported. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. What do you have, Jake? Um, so there's also, so two things. One is um, the begging bowl, right? The Buddha bowl. And so a lot of the, the stories that we have um, about the origins of the begging bowl is because people in the village had food. They had surpluses of food that they would give, not in exchange for the teachings, but because they had extra so I think that that's one one kind of way to demonstrate this. The other, I know specifically um, Deer Park, which is where um, the early Buddhists were gathering for practice, was I believe it was gifted to the Buddha, right, or to to the to the to the monks at the time, and eventually the nuns, um, and. Uh, there are also a couple stories of, um, because before India was India, it was a collection of kin kingdoms. And so a lot of the reason that Buddhism was spreading is because it was touching these kings uh, and that they were actually donating land for retreats and um, the robes, the cloth for the robes and things like that. So um as many of you know eve ekman is teaching on wednesday nights the old path white clouds uh it's a book that is largely quoted from sutras so if we're if you want to learn a little bit more about some of like the specific places that it was coming from it it does mention exactly where some of the things are coming from in that book so it's a good place to to start Great question. I think it's always really good to ask for sources um, so we can, as I was sharing and as Jules was sharing too, I, I noticed a lot of people nodding their heads. So thank you for asking that, that question, Tesla. We're almost at time, but I kind of want to put this out there. What does it feel like for you all to consider gratitude as an ethic? I see something in the chat. I was I was trying to check with Ronnie about whether she had raised her hand a little bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, or or if or if she wanted to share now and no, okay. Uh, I don't know how much of this exactly has to do with um, gratitude as an ethic, but it's the question that I'm asking is, how do I have experience, give gratitude and generosity in situations where I am feeling defensive? Mm. Tell me a little bit more. Well, I can give two specific examples. One is I've traveled in some very poor parts of the world. You know, that sort of classic experience when you get off the bus and you're surrounded by a crowd of people who are begging. And for me, that experience was so overwhelming, kind of this idea that I just can't fix this problem, that there's, even if I gave everything and that suffering, that I found that I got really closed and angry and it just went the complete opposite direction. That the more that that happened, the more I sort of shut into myself and almost actually started to feel some aggression oh. even. And the other example, which is less dramatic, is, is a situation that I'm in now where I go into, there's a classroom where I work that I visit and then leave. And it's a very stressed environment that that they already exists before I get there. And so 
I really want to sort of be this person with a spirit of generosity and peace and coming in to sort of make it better. And I sort of can do that in my actions, but I'm, it's not coming from really a spirit of generosity because I find that I'm reacting to what feels like a sort of an unsafe environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the first the first part of what you were sharing about your experience traveling, it it sounds like there was a threat to your physical safety. Is that where you think some of that reaction was coming from, of kind of like the, the mob coming around you? Or this last ex uh, example that you gave that you felt like it was a threat? I, I think, I don't know if there was actually a threat to my physical safety, but I could see how, yes, that that would, that w that could be perceived that way in the first, in the first example. And in the second example, it, not as much, um, not as much is more sort of, I think, reacting to what is already a volatile mm. situation that I'm walking into. Yeah. The waters that we swim in, right. You know, that this is, I think a lot of the things that we've been hearing, some of the things that I wrote down too, is that we need to be, we need to be in a, a, a good place. We, our nervous system needs to be regulated. That's why at the beginning of all of these ethics classes, there's been some sort of breath work or shaking or mindfulness to make sure that we're grounded, that we're coming from a place of, of um, security and stability before we start exploring these topics. And when when our nervous system is not regulated, it makes any of these ethics really difficult to access. So what was coming up for me as you were sharing is we're not doormats, you know, like compassion, generosity. It doesn't mean that we let people take advantage of us. Right. We need to protect ourselves. We do live in a world where everyone around us is acting with a scarcity and lack mindset, including ourselves. And so it's this very fine line of, I, I keep saying it, the waters we swim in, this is the people that are around us, including ourselves, are conditioned to think this way, lack, scarcity, mindset, threat. And so we need to really make sure that we're taken care of first. There's a whole class that we could do around the difference between our needs and our wants, right? And a lot of the issues are being driven out of the want category. But our need to be safe, to be secure, to be to eat, to have shelter, like our basic needs are so important. And at no point in any of these conversations on ethics am I suggesting that we forego that. So if we're not feeling safe in an environment or in a situation to give or to act in a way that we're talking about here, by all means, take care of take care of yourself. You know, we need to take care of ourselves. Uh, as we look to take care of other people. So I think that's a very natural human response to feeling like there could be a perceived threat there. Um, would that stop you from being generous? Would what stop me? The two examples that you gave where there was kind of like a perception of a threat. Yes. Across the board. Well, I, I don't know, actually, I have to think about that because I, I mean, in the classroom example, I'm still showing up and giving everything that I have to contribute. Beautiful. That's your, your generosity. And you're doing that from a place where it feels safe to do so. <laughs> I think we're kind of edging on a conversation around boundaries here, which yeah. is super important when we're talking about ethics, you know, that we can't like, again, we're not doormats. We can't just let our boundaries down in order to, you know, we're not martyrs. Don't want anyone here to do that. Right. So take care, take care of ourselves. This is this is one of the things that I think, you know, with, with capitalism right now, like we don't have safety nets. We don't have social safety nets. And so we have to take care of ourselves. This these are the waters that we swim in, right? Whether it's physical safety or making sure that we have enough income to survive, feed our families, things like that. Um, but yeah, it sounds, you know, the reason I asked that about whether or not your 
experience was a threat to giving generosity. And you have to think about it, like it maybe in that situation, it wasn't safe to do it or it's taxing or it might be crossing a boundary, but it doesn't mean that we close and we stop being generous. It just might be not that vehicle, not that, not that outlet. Things to consider. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ronnie. And Chelsea. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what comes up for me, I guess, maybe also on the tip of boundaries um, and also social responsibility of ethics is um, thinking through the ways in which we can nurture abundance that we can offer, like what abundance can we offer? Um, you know, thinking about do I have the time, the organizational skills and space to maybe host a you know, clothing swap, or do I have this space in my space in my garden that I'm not using or that I can grow food to offer to others? Or um, it doesn't always have to be monetary. Um, even with the interactions of people requesting money from us or anything along those lines, often people that are houseless or struggling in that way. Um, report people avoiding their eye contact and mm -hmm. the of eye contact. Um, you're talking about like somatic generosity or somatic reception, like giving eye contact or just giving a sincere, I'm unable to give in that way at this moment. You know, I wish you the best. Um, and just being, you know, speaking authentically, I think is something more than they typically get um, in that interaction. So those are just some thoughts that came to me. That. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Noticing a lot of nodding heads as you were talking, um, that it's not necessarily always about the financial, the money aspect of it, but what a gift, you know, to give someone struggling that someone hasn't looked at them in the eye. That's that, that it's, it's, I don't want to say priceless because it's, you know, I want to be sensitive to the nature of the situation that they're in, but it is a huge gift to just get, like you're saying, look at the eye, give them the respect, say hello. I spend a lot of time with um, people who are not housed, uh, an organization that my friends and I put together called A Grateful Day. And the premise was that we were grateful for the things that we have and our enoughness. And so we want to share from that place. And so we would cook food and go out onto the street. And it wasn't really about feeding people. It was more about using it as a vehicle to connect. Right. And so to, you know, um, kneel down or squat down next to them, have a conversation, look them in the eye, ask them how they're doing. Um, and my experience was a lot of them asked me to pray with them. They didn't even want the food, you know, and like how it was really beautiful. And, you know, I would explain my worldview on prayer and say, I'm going to sit with you and I'm going to wish you the best, you know, and wish you safety and security. And two times in the four years that we were doing this, I got letters and like kind of just scribbled on a note that were for my parents saying, you know, like you raised a good son. And so then I got to take the gratitude from that person and give it to my parents. Like talk about a ripple, you know, a ripple, uh, expanding ripple effect so and then the other thing that would come up a lot is people would see us doing this work and they were very curious and so even though they weren't the ones that were directly receiving the gift they were receiving something else whether it was inspiration or a feeling feeling a feeling a good feeling so i really appreciate you sharing that it doesn't have to be money um and i think that's really what Charles Eisenstein is pointing to is like these money systems. It's just where a lot of these issues are and gift giving and, and generosity don't need money to be expressed. It's helpful, but it's not dependent on the monetary systems. Um, so I, I love everything that everyone was sharing because there was such a sense of humanness to it. And that's really why I wanted to bring this, um, this idea of gratitude as the starting point of an ethical way of being, because it brings the humanness back into it rather than the exchange, this kind of transaction aspect. So in summary, it's really about this path of 
orienting ourselves to life as if we're receiving, receiving our senses, receiving these gifts, big or small, receiving light, receiving air. Um, and then in that receiving arises a sense of gratitude. And then in, from that gratitude comes recognition of the gifts that we give. And then there's the ripple effect that starts expanding from there. So something to consider as we move forward from this class is how do we bring this to life in our own worlds? Many of us already do in many ways, big and small. Um, and so as always with all of these classes, the invitation is to sit with this this week. See these teachings, these practices, these conversations, what we're all sharing as kind of seeds. And the invitation here is don't leave this in the room or in Zoom. Go out into the world with this. Talk to your friends and your communities about what does gifting economy mean? How can we embody that? How can we practice this? And even, you know, I think a lot of these classes on ethics, there's big ways and small ways. And I think really developing a consistent appreciation practice um, whether it's through your mindfulness or a heart opening practice, um, as we've been talking a lot about through this series of classes, change starts from within. So us as individuals have the power for great change, for great ripple effects to move out into the world. And it all just starts with gratitude, appreciating what we're receiving. So thank you very much for your presence, your participation, your practice tonight. Um, we have a few more weeks of these classes, so we'll continue meeting through May. Um, as I already mentioned in the teaching, the Dharma Collective is a gifting run organization. Um, so we do appreciate uh, any generosity that you can offer. This is an opportunity for you to practice uh, and know that it greatly benefits the teachers and the center when you do donate. So I know for those of you online, Tia put in the chat ways to uh, offer that gift and then here in the center, um there's some spaces over there to do that as well so